to everyone to the discussion on rebuilding MSME jobs in the times of crisis. Governments, companies, and social sectors are responding to the COVID-19 crisis by taking up urgent steps to manage the fast-evolving skill gaps and availability of works. Yet, there is room and need for greater focus, speed, boldness, and innovation in this effort. Special focus will be needed on restarting and supporting MSMEs, which account for the majority of jobs in India, and many of whose viability is more likely to be put at risk by the crisis. Also, workers across industries must figure out how they can adapt to rapidly changing conditions, and MSMEs have to learn how to match those workers to new roles and activities. So this leaders roundtable discussion will therefore look into different aspects of the productive workforce in the Indian manufacturing sector and aims to derive possible measures that can address the problems faced by the MSMEs and its workers in a post lockdown world. So the discussion will center on a few questions which I'd like to tease for the audience. How the MSME sector and workers are equipped to resume their activities how to rebuild jobs amid the coronavirus crisis, what measures MSMEs can take, what labor-focused support may MSMEs need in regard to skill developments in other sectors and areas. So I would like to welcome all esteemed guests today. We are pleased to have Honorable Member of Parliament, Dr. Vinay Sestra Gudde, as Chief Guest today. Welcome, sir. We also have Mr. Satoshi Sasaki, Deputy Director, ILO India. I would like to begin the session by requesting uh, Dr. Rene Van Berkel, UNIDO representative in India, to set the context for today's discussion. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, good morning uh, to all. Um, I would like to let me see whether I can get a presentation up. Uh, yes, um, uh, it is very clear that uh, MSMEs, as we know, are uh, uh, the backbone of the uh, Indian uh, economy in terms of uh, uh, contribution to GDP as well as uh, contribution to uh, uh, job creation and so on. But that was uh, largely the pre-COVID uh, situation, and now we are in a in a post-lockdown or unlock situation. I don't think we can say fully post-lockdown. So we see that there are many challenges in terms of the uh, employment situation and the job situation for the MSMEs. And we've all seen uh, uh, yeah, unfortunate images of uh, people uh, looking and searching for a livelihood. So uh, very much uh, uh, thank you to the chief guest, uh, Dr. Vine, for uh, joining us for this discussion, and also to my colleague from uh, ILO International Labour Organization, Satoshi, to uh, join us for this uh, discussion. I would like to give a little bit a little bit of a background from the UNIDO perspective, the UN Industrial Development Organization, what we've uh, seen over the last uh, two and a half, three months, and uh, how we are trying to address uh, some of the challenges in the MSME segment uh, through the initiative, which is called Building Back Business from Crisis. Um, so, uh, already early in the uh, lockdown, so in April, we did a, a survey of uh, the work, the clusters in which we were working, which uh, covered about uh, 15 manufacturing clusters, uh, 85 uh, MSME that we spoke with and tried to understand what is the, the real uh, challenges that they were facing. But I have to say that, of course, very time bound. This was in lockdown one, and I think that over time, maybe some issues might have changed a little bit, but at that time, certainly manufacturing came to a standstill and there was basically five issues that came uh, time and time again and the first one is basically the unprecedented uncertainty on what is actually going to happen in society and in market so uh, we we and and still this situation prevails that we we, we know that some uh, uh, slow down of the spread has happened, but we cannot predict what is going to happen. And this uncertainty bites business. And the second point is that uh, is, is the basically the markets uh, that uh, MSMEs, uh, many of them saw basically overnight uh, sales drop from 100 to zero. So plummeted demand. Uh, other sectors saw some demand continuing, but uh, very much the demand is, is gone and needs to be uh, rebuilt. Then the third point is perhaps the most uh, pertinent to today's discussion is the changeover in, in manpower that uh, uh, daily laborers and informal workforce have, uh, have partially left. There have been changes and, and, and so on. So there will be not the same uh, workforce available to restart business. The fourth point, 
and that has had a relatively limited attention in the in the in the uh, public discussion is that uh, the equipment and stocks have been standing idle and some of the stocks have been uh, uh, degrading decayed over the time and some of the equipment has also you might say rusted uh, deteriorated and it's therefore also not immediately safe to restart and we've unfortunately seen some uh, some accidents also happening which is unfortunate but in the term of the restart that as things were not taken seriously enough and then the fifth point was basically disrupted supplies so that uh, and that was in part happening before the lockdown because of course some companies were already having difficulties not having getting spare parts from china and from other places before the lockdown in india so I think that uh, all of this adds to a cash crunch and, uh, and it's clear that MSMEs need liquidity, so they need cash to restart, but they ultimately need demand to recover the cash flow. So just liquidity is not going to uh, solve the, the, the restart issue. And in doing so, it is not like you can switch on a, a, a business like you switch on and off the air conditioner. There is a, quite a number of issues associated to rebuild operations, manpower and supply chains. So even with, if you have all the money and all the demand, it still is a challenge to bring the, uh, if I may use that uh, uh, analogy, the, the the pieces of the jigsaw together to get a, a business that can restart, rebuild uh, its operations. So in that context, we started with this building back business from crisis, B3C, and we see this as a knowledge and collaboration platform that, that because of the, the limitations, we cannot go and handhold enterprises. We have to do a lot of the coaching online and we want to provide a framework for uh, action. So to highlight a roadmap for building back business to restart, recover and revitalize. And then we are also saying that the crisis, of course, has identified some weaknesses in the MSME. So can we take the crisis also as an opportunity to improve areas of business and ultimately we are now seeing that a major investment is made by governments and by civil society in uh, restarting the economy so we need to make sure that there is also uh, if i may use the term a return on investment towards inclusiveness and sustainability towards the big goals that society is trying for so in, with that, we have set it up as a system of, as, as you can see here, tutorials, which is basically videos which explain the topics. Then we have a knowledge base, which is basically checklist, fact sheets, uh, guidance notes. And we are delivering this now uh, through webinars. And we would like to go also to the online uh, delivery, which has not yet started. It's done in a partnership for development and rollout with the India uh, small and medium entrepreneurs forum, the UN India business forum, and which is the entrepreneurship program of UNCTAD. And we launched it in the first part of it on the 30th of April with the Homo Suez Prabhu. Uh, and since then, we have continued to visit. I mentioned that at the core, we have a, a what we call a back to business roadmap, which is essentially having five steps to a sort of plan to recover, then get your workplace ready, then restart with the core operations and look for a revival of growth and then ultimately go into future proof the operations. So I go very briefly through each of these steps. So we, we are saying that, uh, uh, of course, the, the environment of the business has changed and society business scenario. So one needs to look for an actionable plan to basically capture and restart what makes most sense. And some activities might be better to postpone or may not make sense at all. So it doesn't make sense to just restart where you left it before the lockdown, but look for strategic opportunities where additional value, where the good prospects are. Then in terms of ready the workplace, we have talked about making the workplaces safe to minimize the spread of COVID-19. So that is all your uh, social distancing in the workplace, sanitization, uh, health checks before you arrive in the workplace, but also making sure that machinery is working well and that factory are tidied up. So you have different standard operating procedures for people to, to work and move in factories. So we need to make that this comes all together again. Then the restart to recover is basically the first uh, part of the restart journey to to de bottleneck and restart the business operations in terms of operations, so the manufacturing operations, adjusting the workflows, adjusting supply chain, and trying to re-establish sales. And the fourth part is uh, is more focusing on bringing growth back to business. 
Uh, and that is uh, very much saying that uh, how how can we focus on the core business competencies? Uh, because we have also noticed that you needed that in some cases, business, small and small and medium sized enterprise are not very focused on what they do. They they pick up any opportunity and would rather like to uh, them to help to to do better what they are already good at and to do better what they are good at also for different applications. So to improve their current operations and to diversify, to repurpose. And we've seen some examples of uh, uh, car manufacturers that have 3D printing machines that can now produce and manufacture a part for ventilators or uh, instead of stitching jeans, you can stitch uh, uh, face masks and the like uh, things. So that is doing what you're good at differently. And then the fifth stage is the, to think ahead and set your business up for continuity through uncertain and unfavorable times. That is a lot about a business continuity planning. And ultimately, one can also see uh, is that then the standardization that could come up for the ISO 23001 and related issues. So that is more the, the long term. How can we uh, avoid, how can we set ourselves up and be more anticipatory on events that might happen? So to just show them a, a little bit of how this looks like here, you see these tutorials are basically uh, narrated uh, uh, short lectures, six, seven minutes where we highlight the, uh, the issue. So I just take, took up the one we start where we talk about what can be done in operations, supply, sales, and then we get this kind of uh, tables with uh, what would be uh, tips and hints that generally uh, MSME operators might consider. And I mentioned that this is linked then to uh, a knowledge base. So we set up uh, guidance notes. So we, we did some uh, narratives on how to do the problem solving in practice and then also checklists. So here you see how to get your uh, workforce uh, established with practical tips and hints. This is all online on b3cmsme.org. I mentioned then also this uh, uh, um, Chinese uh, character, which is claimed, and I think the Chinese uh, linguists are not necessarily agreeing, but that is a combination of data and opportunity. So looking at the opportunity, and there we have seen that with this back to business roadmap is embedded in areas of big business excellence. And we've identified the modules which are basically addressing uh, entrepreneurship, finance, customers, supply chain, operations, manpower, health and safety. So we, we think that cutting across the, the roadmap to bank, get you back into business, one can look at opportunities, how to improve operations, how to improve the entrepreneurial capability. And entrepreneurial capability is something which is not limited to the SME operator, but also embedded in the teams and the operations. So uh, they are uh, in there. So for today's theme, uh, we, uh, we want to highlight uh, uh, more on the manpower and manpower, I think it's very much also linked to health and safety. So to just give a, a sense of what we have included in this package as manpower, we are uh, putting this on the manpower module, we are saying that we need to protect and value employees while deploying manpower to achieve efficiency and productive operations again. And for this, we basically have three uh, variables that we can look at. So that's the people the, to ensure the safety, but also look at the skills. And we need to look at the places where they work. So what's the workstations? And there will be changes because basically to prevent the spread of disease, one will have to implement basically one workstation, one worker per shift kind of thing. So the flexibility is no longer there because we need to contain the spread of the disease and so on. So there will be also perceptions and there will be some workers might say, OK, my job became more boring, but that might be part of it. Or we have the screens between uh, operators sitting there. They won't sit op opposite sides of the uh, uh, conveyor belt, but at the same side and so on. And so that's the place to work. And then the third is the procedure. Uh, so, uh, what is then the standard operating procedures for manufacturing, but also linked for cleaning and maintaining uh, facilities. And of course, cutting across this, uh, there is a, a lot of emphasis, and that's uh, certainly our ILO college would, uh, college would emphasize that the more the teamwork, the, the collaboration in the workforce uh, and in the, in the enterprise would help to achieve efficiency and productivity of operations. So better collaboration with the supervisors, workers, factory hands, and, and ultimately the, the management of the corporate, of the businesses. 
So then uh, I, I mentioned also that we, we have an opportunity. We, there, is, there is a non-negotiable need to address the uh, spread of COVID, so infection uh, prevention and control. But can we extend this to ad addressing also the long, uh, long-standing issues on occupational health and safety? And that is uh, basically we see the international standard is very much become that we, we are aiming for a, a zero harm to people. And uh, how can we emphasize that there, are, there is certainly uh, uh, too much of evidence that there are people are getting hurt in the workplace or might not return in the evening from their to their families, and that is that is an issue that needs to be addressed. So we've highlighted that in terms of the disease control, but also the hazards, and also addressing a, a conducive work environment. So people who are, if I may use that term, happy in the workplace. They will also be more productive, more committed to stay with the enterprise, and they will also be more valuable to the entrepreneur. So we need to get to a situation where workers are valued as, as assets, as, as contributing, not just as a cost in that sense. So that is uh, the uh, work that we have on health and safety. I wanted to maybe uh, then this, this this is very much this B3C is very much on the short term what what can be done. So what is immediate opportunities, but we also see what what will be the new normal. And I think that uh, from the new normal, and certainly the, the UN as a whole, also the Secretary General has spoken out very much that health and well-being should be first. So we will expect to see. But it's also a little bit of uh, crystal ball glazing that, that there will be more investment and opportunities in the healthcare se sector and health and supportive sectors that could be pharma, medical equipment, and all those sectors associated with that. I think that also, uh, certainly for the case of uh, of India and other uh, developing countries, the, the emphasis is very much put on the on the hygiene. So we would see uh, uh, an additional impetus for the Swach Bharat um, kind of uh, mission to to enforce to to create a culture of hygiene around this, which will certainly help there. Then the third point, which I, I which I see here, is that that we, this will also translate it to enhance the consideration for occupational health and safety in the workplace. So a broader agenda of keeping people well and and safe in the workplace. And I think that a, a little bit further, but maybe less tangible, would be a further push for uh, uh, the voluntary sustainability standards, for a kind of sustainability standards imposed by uh, uh, international buyers that they want to see that uh, workers are being cared for, and uh, also in terms of crisis, and that we also ad uh, adhere to uh, social and environmental standards. So that will be under the health and well-being first. So support healthcare, a wash kind of uh, hygiene drive, occupational health and safety, and, and also standards around this that uh, uh, compliance for international value chains. But then I think that there's also the towards new normal, which translates more to the, the nuts and bolts, so to speak, of the transformation of global production and consumption systems. And even though it, I, I believe it's it's difficult to to be very affirmative of how this will look like, we see that we we expect that this will be driven largely by three drivers. So there will be a drive for more circularity. Uh, so so basically paying attention to the environment and the and and to a certain extent, uh, colleagues have also argued that maybe the disease is also a result of the uh, man uh, nature conflict so there will be more emphasis on doing renewables waste management sanitation uh, uh, environment related so i put that under the umbrella of circular the digitized I think some people have already com commented that we, we probably uh, transferred further in the digital revolution and industry 4.0 in the last three months than we did in the last four years or so, because we have seen a lot of transition, people going online, remote control, remote working and so on. But I think that is more on the business side of sales and, and, and servicing and maybe not yet on the manufacturing side where more longer transitions will be there. But there will be certainly a push for more digitized workplaces and certainly there will be also a limit that, that in the, uh, compared to pre-COVID times, we cannot get the same amount of people safe in the same workspaces, in offices or factory halls or so. So we need to find uh, solutions there. And then the third element I put here as the, the resilience, which is more of the global value chains and related ones. So uh, I think the, the, there's, a, there's a, an appreciation that the 
the scale of the current impacts are also in part because of the interconnectedness of the global value chains and how can we get out of that. So we will see in the short term that uh, companies are doing stress tests, are looking for redundancies in the value chains, are looking for a second or third sourcing op, uh, or, or location for their products. And that might indeed be an opportunity for India, but also maybe a, a rethinking of the kind of the, the traditional notion in export processing zones, that it will be more integrated manufacturing operations and manufacturing and innovation ecosystems. I think that each of these three topics would be probably uh, ones where we could uh, debate for, for, for a day long on uh, what it would mean and how it would work out. But these are kind of big, big drivers which we, we observe. Um, so I'm, I probably would like to uh, to stop here, just emphasizing again that that uh, there is there are challenges for MSMEs. A lot is being focused on the on the financial side, and this is uh, legitimate in the sense that liquidity is needed to restart business and to recreate demand. And the demand will ultimately drive the businesses. But even with all the money and all the uh, demand in place, there will still be a challenge to adjust the technology, the operations, the workforce. And for that, we created this B3C MSME website. And I would really endorse people, uh, I recommend people to, to have a look and, and see what can be done there. And we, uh, yeah, the UN agencies, ILO, UNIDO are keen to, to work with MSMEs to, to roll this out. And then the longer term impacts that there, there could be roles in terms of circularity, uh, digitalization and uh, sustainability or changes of value chains. So with that, thank you very much. I hand over to uh, Maitre. You're muted. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Rene, for underlining the challenges which need to be addressed by MSMEs in your address. And uh, we have the honor to have Dr. Vina with us for the discussion. His contribution in the form of the ICANN initiative has been exemplary in the domain, especially catering to migrant workers, which are the backbone of most of the MSMEs in India. So it would be really insightful if you could please share your thoughts on the topic of discussion. Uh, well, uh, basically, the ICANN initiative, the origin of the initiative was uh, in the fact or rather the realization of the fact that due to the destabilization that the COVID-19 has caused, there were many uh, pockets uh, in the urban uh, areas and also rural areas for that matter, where there were people who were uh, in need of uh, some support. And at the same time, there was uh, a huge number of uh, good Samaritans also who wanted to reach out and extend some help. Now, there was no platform where a help giver can really find a genuine help seeker. And therefore, uh, we evolved a platform which is uh, India COVID Action Network. And uh, there onwards, uh, what has happened during the last couple of months is uh, really something very, uh, I mean, remarkable in the sense that uh, hundreds of people got some help, not just uh, in terms of money or maybe food supplies or certain other issues, but even, for example, uh, there were students who wanted uh, to have some tuitions. Their teacher, of course, could not come. He was not equipped with facility of uh, eat, uh, to e e I mean, e tuitions or things like that. While there were people who wanted to help and reach out to these students and engage in some kind of an e tuition, so we connected. There were people who wanted to kind of have uh, uninterrupted supply of masks, uh, which are more uh, user friendly kind of. And there were some uh, self-help groups run by some women and some artisans also in Uttar Pradesh and several other areas who were uh, in the business of uh, creating very artistically designed masks who were uh, at the same time very useful and very attractive also. So we connected them and that is how uh, uninterrupted supply of masks started in the rural areas where they were not uh, available, especially the 
N19 variety, which we heard about for the first time during the last three months earlier. Nobody was knowing as to what this N95 is exactly. So the changing situation in a way forced us to evolve this platform. And looking back, I can say that uh, this is going to be a permanent platform because at every point of time, we require networking. And in a networking uh, kind of uh, uh, requirement, the requirement of networking makes us uh, approach those who are in need of some help and those who are desire of extending that help. And that is what is required. Even in the uh, current situation when we are talking about MSME sector. Now, I'm sure simply because of uh, a lack of communication and information, uh, maybe there are people who can perhaps uh, uh, sell their products to a particular market which is waiting for those products, but nobody knows that there is a source of uh, uh, that particular supply chain. And here is uh, a particular market which is waiting to utilize those products, whether uh, the sanitizers or the masks or all those things which are currently required. For example, the Ayush Ministry has come out with several uh, Ayurvedic products which are uh, working really very well and providing some support in this uh, particular uh, situation. But then again, how, how do we ensure that the help seeker or those who are in need of certain things are supported and through kind of a connectivity, uh, some kind of a outreach uh, happens and those who are willing to reach out to those uh, are given that piece of information and then that connection happens. That is what is required. And I think uh, it was a very small effort, but I must say a very successful effort as well. Thank you, sir. Uh, we would like to now move uh, to the discussion and I would like to put the first question to Mr. Satoshi here to begin with. Uh, welcome to the discussion, Mr. Satoshi. Uh, ILO has forecast that the pandemic could uh, uh, reduce global working hours by nearly 7% in the second quarter of 2020 and equivalent to 195 million full-time jobs. Millions of jobs could also be lost permanently. What impact do you see in India, especially relating to MSMEs? And what do you think should be the initial plan of action to battle this situation? Yeah, thank you very much. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Unido, for inviting ILO for this discussion. It's very really, uh, useful. And uh, I'm sure that for the, the hundreds or the thousands of all the uh, business operators who are listening in uh, to this sort of webinar, and would find a way as to how they can be what uh, unlock down situation, how restarting the business operations. And as just what they introduced that, uh, well, the the worldwide uh, unemployment situation is what are really uh, difficult at the moment. Uh, even the uh, India, but this morning with the newspaper information telling us that well, before the lockdown situation, for its, uh, the unemployment rate was 8%. And after the lockdown, it's going up, went up to well, the 17%, now coming down to 11% after the opening the economy, which is not a bad situation. But, uh, the thing is that for the, this, uh, the recovering of the employment is likely more depending on the self-employment and the casual work, but not really to the wage workers yet. And uh, well, well, if the um, I'm asked for the whether the, the business are ready to going back to the business, uh, my straight answer is maybe not. Well, because well, they need a good well, support from the government and other things. Uh, like well, the Prime Minister would well, announce that well, the, uh, the government will set aside well, 20 lakh rupees. Uh, for the, the uh, collateral free loans, for the debt, uh, the provision and equity infusions. But also I'm asking the question of whether this for the support can really reaching out to the MSME and also particularly the informal ones. 
And as for the support to the ones who lost the jobs, I think uh, the, the short-term employment creation schemes like Nulega is critically important, as well as for the income transfers, uh, different schemes. But the, the question of the reopening the economy, um, whether the uh, the business has business and consumer well, have the confidence in the opening the economy, it's really challenging. And for the, in other in other countries, for the government trying to well the directing for the procurement for the tours for more smaller smaller vendors, and also provide setting uh, stepping up the, the offering the the, the direct. Uh, subsidies and also the tax rebates, as well as a, a payment of deferrals to the MSMEs, so that for the, they can be uh, uh, ready to come back for for the business. But I think for the, the, the India um, can do a little uh, some more things for the for making for the business easier to reopening for example about for the, the the human resources Rene mentioned that for the the ones for the, who lost the jobs it may not be the necessary the same ones to come back to the same business well in this respect as to how the, the enterprises can manage the the people to work again and then perhaps for the something like for the online for the talent would change to quickly redeploy the the, the the labor force across the states who are uh, considering for the uh, the migrant workers to work in the different different states but that kind of the facility could be very useful and important and also the government should consider the uh, reducing the, the regulatory or the barriers uh, like what preparing the fast track with issuance of the, the business licenses, considering that the business can tweak their businesses or early uh, opening in the different for the, the, the business areas. So as to how make it easier for the business to come back and to the starting the new businesses uh, is important. And maybe uh, between the businesses, the larger business and the smaller business can would organize for the alliance. As what I mentioned for the about for the his organization in their COVID action for the platform to help uh, the business to start up. For the bigger business can for the advice for the smaller business as to how they can find for the new business opportunities. And also importance of the the uh, the protect the uh, most for the vulnerable segment of the, the MSMEs, which is for the informal enterprises, uh, gig economy workers, and in the uh, long run, for as to how we can make sure that for the unemployment, for the benefits, uh, minimum wage, uh, and discrimination laws, and for the well. Uh, Retirement for the benefit could be available this for the people, so that would make the this for the situation for the uh, building what they did better or the back for the building building back for the better in the future. And the rebuilding the the, uh, the jobs, well as it was mentioned that for the ILO was uh, calculated that for the seven percent of the uh, the working hours has been lost and were 190, 195 million for the full-time jobs for the, has been lost in the past months. And this sort of means that for the perhaps for the millions of jobs cannot be for the, the coming back, means for the loss for the uh, permanently. And again, I have I want to mention that for the, this for the means that for the, uh, the loss of the, the, uh, the consumer market in the country. The one of the strengths of the India is that having well, the internal, the, the domestic for the market, so that even with the result for the uh, exporting uh, the market, uh, we can well, do the business in country as well. But if the, the consumer confidence is lost, that also means that for well, the uh, local market is also shrinking. So we have to work in a very difficult situation now. And to retain the workforce, well, the best thing is that the, the business 
existing business should be uh, continue to work. And to do that, it is important that for the, 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 the public for the support to be given to the uh, MSMEs for supporting their for the fix for the cost. After three months of close down, it is not easy for any businesses uh, to pay for the fix for the cost. And also providing for the grant and for the tax incentives. Also the credit availability is important. And as to how we can do it more on the uh, uh, intensive for the investment and the government for the, the uh, procurement for the, the more towards the uh, involving for the MSMEs. And also the perhaps for the government can consider more about for the digital payment of these for the, the government payments to the MSMEs so that for the, we can expedite for the time required for the payment. That makes for the easier for the, the, the capitals to be utilized again by the enterprises. Question answer box is enabled, but uh... yeah, and also let the let me check let me check with the nickel if you can type. And also the uh, as to how again what I should mention that for the new enterprises can be established, government could think about for the easing the deregulations, and what make it easy for the enterprises to start and restarting the businesses. For businesses, I think uh, Rene also mentioned about the repurposing of the business. That for the, under the current for the uh, the situation. Uh, prevailing the new market as to how the, the business can capture this for the new business opportunities. And also, well, in terms of the retention of the workers, uh, business can consider the different options like for the work sharing, uh, as to how you can retain the, the workers in the businesses and also shorter working the weeks. And to do all these things, what I would like to uh, emphasize the importance of the social dialogue. Uh, well, at the enterprise level, it's a kind of something like well, the, the, the workplace cooperation that for the uh, both for the employers and the workers for the discussing together for their common benefit as to how the, the business can be retained so that for the uh, employment opportunities can be retained. It's for the win-win situation, otherwise the, both of them will lose. So the, the social dialogue between the employers and the workers is critically important. And on the reskilling for issues, obviously the in the, the, uh, the new the business environment as to how the, the, the business have to prepare for reskilling of the workers. Well, the means that as to how to, what kind of the skills and for, for the business recovery is one thing, but also the new skills to be retained, uh, obtained by the workers, like for the digitalization of the economy is one thing, but also, uh, adaptation to the business or the, the environment is another, but in the long run as to how the business can be more resilient. And perhaps also we have to think about for the social and the emotional aspect of the, the, the workers as well. So detecting the, the uh, what are the business for the skills for the gaps and the make for the money available to provide for the workers with the, the learning opportunities. And think about for the, the, the reskilling or the training, uh, three things for the new. The one thing is that most of the training will be provided online. And uh, the courses should be shorter interventions because of the, the immediate needs of these for the skills. So the recognizing skills should be done in a different way. And so, the businesses have to think about what the, the your competitors in organizing for the skills development trainings. You need to collaborate with others. Perhaps so this sort of training should be done at the, uh, the industry level. And to think about as to how these people can come 
work in the in the in the, the workplace. I think what the most thing, important thing is that the advice on the safe return to work, uh, including obvious occupational safety and health. Obviously, it means that uh, the the other worker will not for the capture the the, the COVID nineteen. But also, Rene mentioned that for the us the blank of the, the three months in the past as to how the workplace can be with the safer uh, to start up the the the, uh, the, uh, the lines uh, whether it's for the already uh, the good for the workers is it for the same for the workers to 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 start again and also the providing the access to the the health services once it happens as to how the, the workers can access to the health services and also importance of the, the prevention of the discrimination and exclusions, whether they have for the, the uh, COVID-19 in the in the previous months and coming back again, uh, with the, the condition is okay now, but will as to how they can protect the workers uh, from the, the, the discriminations. This is for the very important, so that kind of for the, the negotiation and understanding within the uh, the workplace among the workers between the employers and workers it's critically important and ad adaptations to the the work arrangement like for the time place frequency time in terms of the uh, whether we should do the the, uh, the work sharing kind of arrangement or workplace can it be done from the the, the uh, from home like with the teleworking and frequency uh, often they, they will to the office and for the gradually more uh, regular operations so kind of the, the temporary or the arrangement should be very important about what the skills for the uh, the skills and the list for the importance of it and the ILO at the moment for the having a lot of information already available on returning to the to, to work uh, it's uh, the all about, uh, available on the ILO website and for what for the, for example the guidance note of the safe return to work would have mentioned uh, two critically important things one is the human centered approach whatever the business wherever you operate whatever you produce it is important that uh, the workers issues should be considered safety and for the good for the working conditions that make sense for the business in the long run and also again i want to mention about for the social dialogue you have to create a win-win situation in the workplace that can be done only through the, the, the dialogue between the employers and workers how it can happen discuss with your with your workers and for the world how can it be done in the best way for the enterprise to operate for the back in the business social dialogue is important thank you very much i, I just want to stop here thank you mr satoshi uh, i would like to now request Rene to please come in and take the discussion forward please uh Yes, uh, thank, you, thank you very much. And I think uh, both uh, contributions were most valuable. I think, uh, Dr. Vina, you, you highlighted that basically uh, with all the misery, there's also been quite a good uh, Samaritans who have uh, wanted to do the right things. And we, we've seen everywhere uh, uh, initiatives popping up from, from businesses, keeping their workers, providing meals and so on. But maybe uh, uh, at times uh, 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 of a smaller scale compared to the huge challenges that there are. So, so I think that is that's also good that uh, that people have stepped up and uh, and uh, and provided support and hand holding and and caring for each other uh, i think satoshi you highlight a few uh, important items i think uh, what you highlighted also throughout is uh, kind of we need a, a, a bit of flexibility to come back uh, forward with uh, uh, with the uh, workplace arrangements maybe shorter work times uh, sharing of workforce facilitation of easy startup and 
re business registration so that we can get some adjustments. So adjustments are needed so can we uh, avoid getting uh, bureaucratic barriers in the way of uh, the adjustments that are needed. But there are a few themes, so I take the, the prerogative as a moderator, which I, maybe I would like uh, both uh, uh, panelists and maybe myself, I will then also come. Uh, may, maybe I, I can start with the health concerns, because I think that uh, uh, there, there is, as we unlock, there is a kind of habituality to speak about post-COVID. And which is, of course, the, the biggest misnomenum because COVID will be around and there's a kind of reluctance. And also, if I walk casually around here and see the building sites reopening, then there is all kind of concerns that uh, that the uh, basic precautionary measures are, are easily forgotten in that sense. We have highlighted in our approach that we need to do health monitoring, that we need to keep the, the distance, that we need to do the sanitization. We need to avoid using uh, the same tools, the same pens, the same same telephones by the same people, uh, go uh, paperless, go cashless, and those uh, 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 links, and then, of course, uh, personal protective equipment, but the PPE should be uh, complementary to the basic fundamental uh, rules. But this is going to be a, a, a really a, a huge challenge, particularly in the more informal work settings or, or, or construction sites and so on. But my, what, what concerns us or what has been uh, uh, um, uh, in, on our mind is how can we maybe use this to generate more interest for the occupational health and safety uh, uh, aspects, also from from government, from policy makers, from employers, from uh, from workers, and so on. So maybe uh, Dr. Vine, may I ask you to comment on this? Is there a real opportunity that we can say let's take this occupational health and safety as a core value? Yeah, I think so. And uh, I believe at the at the basic at, at the basis of the entire thing, I mean, this approach is uh, the human element of sensitivity with each other about each other. I mean, unless and until we are sensitive to the agonies and aspirations of those who are working in our establishment, for example, if I am running a business in India, there are many business houses uh, who run the business not uh, with the traditional employer employee relationship but almost like a family yes. and that family element that that element of that feeling that connectivity that relationship cultivation like we are all family members and there is some kind of an element of mutuality if i don't take care of my employers uh, my employees then employees are not going to take care of me and therefore, we have to take care of each other. That sense is very, very required. And that is prevalent in uh, several uh, traditional and old uh, establishments uh, in India, uh, maybe before the globalization era. Uh, Post-globalization, uh, there are several changes between our social and cultural relationship patterns as well. So they have affected to a certain extent. But I think this model alone will take us to think about the other and then prepare ourselves also in that context. And here again, I would like to know whether uh, the ILO and even uh, organizations like UNIDO are going to uh, help the establishments to evolve this kind of a pattern of relationship between the employer and the employees. Because there are several other factors also. For example, one factor which is there perhaps in most of the developing countries which is what Mahatma Gandhi had told us about the dignity of labor. For example, no work is inferior. Every work, whether it is uh, more demanding on the count of your physical labor or your intellectual input, both are of equal, I mean, uh, they, they deserve equal respect. That has to be the fundamental thinking. Otherwise, unfortunately, uh, there is some kind of a con class conflict. And those who are doing intellectual, so quote unquote, kind of work, they believe that they are they are superior to those who are working uh, as physical laborer, maybe. And therefore, this dichotomy has to be put and put a complete end. We have to ensure that uh, there is no conflict between the two. We are all uh, sailing in the same boat in that sense because COVID doesn't uh, spare anybody for that matter. In a crisis uh, like this, everybody is equally vulnerable. And therefore, those who are marginalized, those who are disadvantaged, those who are more deprived 
needed to be taken care of more. We have to put them on the pedestal first and take care of them first. That is what is required and therefore the entire uh, relationship dynamics requires to be revisited, if I may put it very simply. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much uh, to, to respond to your question. What is uh, Unido ILO doing? I cannot speak on behalf of ILO, but Unido uh, certainly has a, has a, a quite a long uh, track record of working with the MSME sector. Uh, I mean, uh, specifically on occupational health and safety. We work, for example, with the Kampur leather sector, where uh, notorious uh, uh, employment conditions have been prevailing for historically. Uh, we introduced basic occupational health and safety, safe management of chemicals. Uh, uh, we've also uh, saying uh, basically that that investing in proper uh, workplaces is paying into efficiency. I take often the, the simple example: if you have a worker in a in a textile dye house and it's all open drains, the, the laborer will the whole day think of how could do I get home tonight without breaking my leg. Uh, to put it very bluntly, and the other way around is to say, okay, if I level the floor and it's a safe workplace, then I can expect my labor to be folks to die on 130 and three degrees instead of about 130. So there is many benefits uh, that are there, and this is certainly an agenda that uh, needs to be uh, catered forward or brought forward, and and also to bring more the productivity teams, the team spirits on, on manufacturing lines. But this this seems to be more uh, uh, that resonates better with perhaps the medium and the more established businesses where the, the level of informality is much less. But I also agree that uh, many businesses are a family kind of business and people are basically also prepared to, to take responsibility. And uh, I mean, uh, in, in my earlier work, I was, for, uh, for example, also working in Vietnam and there we were saying my factory, my responsibility, my success in that sense. And, and maybe I, in Vietnamese, it sounded very nice. I'm sure that in Hindi, or there's also some phrases that can be captured around this to take uh, responsibility there. And so, so if I may turn them back to you, Satoshi, maybe you can also highlight on the on ILO work on the, on the occupational health and safety, and maybe also uh, take forward and the discussion on this, this informality and the formalization of the workplace relations. So maybe you can briefly highlight a, a few items of uh, you need ILO uh, perspectives on this. Yeah, thank you, Lene. Well, obviously, well, currently the COVID-19 situation is kind of, oh, Making clear what are the the, the, uh, the health needs in the different to the levels of enterprises, and uh, well, most important thing is that for well, the person will be uh, well, the, the workers will be well protected uh, in the workplaces, and to do it for the um, occupational safety and health, where well, the measures are relatively simple in that sense. For example, the, the taking the social distance in the workplace and also the washing your hands. But what important thing is that these things are really done in the workplaces. So uh, regulations and the, the ag agreement at the, the, the workplace level is what are really important. And what the ILO has a lot of other materials already already available that what the, the enterprises can use in the workplaces, like for the posters, for the training, for the videos, for these things are available. And what is important is that for the workers really understand what they have to in the workplaces. That's what the first thing. And the uh, benign, I, I like the idea of the, the, the community level, the traditional way of thinking, helping each other. This, this is what, what really needed at the uh, workplace, that the, uh, the workers and the employers together to the helping each other uh, to create what the safer uh, the workplaces. And uh, in the long run, I think uh, more important thing, particularly for the ones who have no access to the the, the public uh, the, the the protections for the schemes. Uh, in the long run, but the particular importance of the, the health insurance, ESI, the things so it could be extended uh, to be accessed by the, the informal workers who cannot have access at the moment. So that uh, the ones for the, they have for the health for the issues, including for the COVID-19, uh, they have all these certain ways to be treated for the properly. So I think for the public, for the support for providing access for informal workers. 
for the the uh, the health insurance uh, could be uh, the, the issue that would make the things for the better uh, the everyone's for the mentioning about the new a new normal but for the ILO director general mentioned that would better new normal not just for the new normal situation but it has to be better in that sense I think for the protection of the workers in this respect is for the very important and the, in this respect, I also want to emphasize once again the importance of the um, social dialogue. Why? Because at the, the moment, for the back to the business, is everyone's concern. As I mentioned, that for the, it will be a win-win or a lose-lose situation. Win-win if for the employers and the workers were the discussing on the specific issues. Then recently there was the, the argument on the, the working hours, whether it can be extended to the 12 hours for three months or so. I was definitely going against it because it is important if for the person work for the 60 hours per week, what will happen after, after three months? This is a health concern. This is not for the, the something that would it to be allowed for, for temporarily. This is why I was the definitely were the mentioning to the, the writing to the Prime Minister that were the asking for the uh, reconsideration. And for the, this is why it is important that for the always for the employers and the workers together with the government were the discussing as to how minimis by minimizing the impact of the COVID-19 that were the make ready for the, the workers to come back to the, the office, the workplaces. Well, I'm not saying that for the eight hours is a maximum hours. Yes, yes it is, but there's a ways that we're the discussing agreeing on as to how it can be, it can be safer for the work, uh, the workers to work, that would make it for the possible to have for the skilled workers to contribute in the opening. In that sense, for the, the flexibility should be allowed, but for the, the no is no. Something for the, we need to discuss and what it has to be on the tripartite consultation. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Satoshi. I, I wanted to, to take the conversation a little bit to a different point. Uh, I mean, there is a, a lot of discussion about uh, uh, how we can help uh, restart uh, the MSME sector and what is the kind of the government assistance recovery packages. And we've seen that the recovery package so far is focusing very much on the, the loans, the capital requirement. And uh, uh, we also know that uh, the MSMEs are telling us that uh, uh, the, the uh, retrenching workers is not the first priority, but but they feel uh, uh, as as the only way out at times. So so that is also what Satoshi was referring to. That uh, what is the options for some kind of an, a, a job uh, support scheme, uh, which is very much the the kind of recovery uh, mechanisms which are done, with, for example, in, in in Europe, in Japan, that uh, uh, that there is some some uh, uh, partial funding of jobs by a government, so to keep employees uh, employed, and and in that way, so so the kind of job support, income support through em employers or through uh, MSMEs. So, so uh, Dr. Vinay, what's your view on that? Is that something that, that India could uh, could uh, attempt to also do to, to encourage uh, MSMEs to retain the workforce and also be, in that sense, agile to recover if the business picks up because they would retrench workers now and in three months or six months they might regret it. So to bridge this uh, gap, is that something that could be considered in the current environment and, and what could be a, a practical way? Well, I think uh, if we take a macro view, kind of, and uh, first of all, believe uh, and convince ourselves and others also that we have to, first of all, spread optimism. I mean, the more we do that, the better for the entire climate. I mean, some kind of a different climate change, I would say, that from pessimism, we have to fast move towards optimism. Everything is going to be normal sooner than later. That is how we have to convince ourselves. Of course, that doesn't mean that we can be careless about uh, whatever the precautions that are to be taken. But at the same time, although new normal and all these terminologies are very attractive, but let us also understand that nothing can compete with the normal, which is what you and all of us understand. So we have to limp back to normalcy. 
and slowly but certainly we can do that that is the confidence that has to be generated therefore it starts with some kind of a spread of optimism that we can really go back to the normal situation uh, maybe it may take a little more time but we can do that that is the first fundamental thing which i believe is required then only people can think of retaining the workforce and uh, also kind of even at the cost of some uh, losses uh, uh, i mean fiscal losses or whatever the deficit but this is this is our duty because later on on the basis of this entire workforce we can build more upon the opportunities that the new situation may create for us that optimism i think will we all of us will to generate firstly secondly i would suggest that uh, uh, some new opportunities and new methodologies also will have to be uh, looked for because uh, once we appreciate that the situation may not for the foreseeable future of time be as normal as we may expect it to be let us take the example of uh, Uh, tuition classes for example i mean it's not uh, traditionally an msme industry as such but yes there are huge people who are into the business of uh, conducting tutorials now instead of having a typical classroom like situation where uh, uh, students are there maybe in hundreds and a teacher is there now of course online training and all these things are happening but instead if we can innovate think a little out of the box and have some kind of a chain of tutorials when i teach somebody the other one also teaches somebody and it goes on there is a kind of a chain mechanism which could be evolved out of that where one can earn and learn as well so some new kind of uh, parameters will have to evolve uh, some out of box thinking will have to be there now uh, take the example i mean we talk in terms of uh, micro small and medium scale but there are uh, some people who are below the micro for example there are uh, artisans village artisans in india in huge number there are potters there are carpenters there are sculptors now who is going to take care of them for the sake of their products to be taken to the market i think we will have to uh, ensure that people believe that it is in their interest i mean the old principle of live and let live will have to be reminded people will have to be told about this that uh, life is not simply you remain in a safe uh, kind of an environment and uh, be disregarding about the situation uh, beyond the safe zone in which you are i mean we are all inter all, all the futures are intertwined we are connected with each other and therefore we also have to step out and reach out to the people for example as i said the village artisans uh, their survival depends upon uh, this uh, consumerism kind of unless and until we go and purchase now when will i do that when there is some confidence in my mind that if not tomorrow day after tomorrow things are going to be normal and therefore that atmosphere will uh, is required to be created therefore that uh, confidence building is required which starts as i said with spreading optimism if we continue to harp upon i mean everybody will have to be sharing concerns no doubt about it and we cannot have that gung ho approach where we can say oh come nothing is going to happen that that is uh, foolishness but at the same time to be careful at the same time to be cautiously moving ahead both the things will have to go hand in hand and somebody has put it very nicely that we have to keep social distance but let us not translate that distance into kind of an emotional distance we have to cover our mouth but let us keep our heart and our mind open for new ideas for innovative thinking for out of the box kind of uh, things we have to wash our hands but we cannot wash off our hands to the responsibility that we all collectively shoulder so these things i basically believe are very very required to be uh, taken to the people people will have to be convinced that things are going to be normal may not be tomorrow but day after tomorrow or maybe in the next week 
thank you thank you very much and uh, also for for uh, highlighting that uh, uh, it is not all doom and gloom we should have a, a spirit that uh, together we can fight this and together we can find a, a way forward uh, in, in that sense and not being uh, uh, ruthless in, in a sense of or, or not uh, uh, based in the reality but uh, but all cautiously optimistic towards a, a, a future I, I I think that is also very much uh, linked to the, the the kind of trust that we wanted to do with our building back uh, from crisis initiative saying that okay it is misery and that we should not ignore that but we can find ways forward and there is good uh, good engineering practice good management practice good people skills that can be deployed to to get us out of where we are right now but there is one more specific one and I would like maybe as a last question to you uh, I'd like your response on that because in the in the in the perspective of opportunity that people are also saying we, we see now the reverse migration we see people who have a, a semi-skilled or a lower skilled maybe not the highest skills worker but we have an we, we you might say we have a net inflow of skills back and workforce into the uh, villages and, and uh, remote areas. So is there an opportunity around and, and how could we capture that? Could we mobilize this workforce? Because they, they will not all be ready to go back to the to Chennai or, uh, or Ahmedabad or wherever the place is. Is there opportunities that we can capture on them to create enterprises to, to work in, in sectors which are neglected, like food processing, the affordable housing, all the, the things which we need for rural development? And what is the kind of thinking on this from your perspective? Yeah, I think uh, you have touched upon a very, a very important subject. And I can tell you from the on, on the basis of my own first hand experience when I had the opportunity of uh, spending some time for an election campaign in uh, uh, the area which is known as Purvanchal, which is the eastern part of Uttar Pradesh. Uh, and if you have traveled into that area, which is around Varanasi and Ghazipur and uh, all those areas, uh, there you will find that uh, due to the Ganga water flowing, uh, huge, uh, I mean, abundant water is available and therefore lush green fields are there everywhere for everybody to see. But unfortunately, even uh, a huge production of wheat, for example, there are no bakery industries that have developed over there. There is Absolutely. milk also abundantly available. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, dairy industry as such has not uh, developed the way uh, the availability of milk is there. So we will have to, and from where are these uh, laborers coming to Mumbai and Ahmedabad and places like that? They are from Purvanchal, essentially. Yes. Can we use that manpower? Can we convert this uh, migrate this reverse migration into opening up of several job opportunities over there? Not only that, I would also suggest that the industries also can think about. For example, there are units in Surat, uh, gem and jewelry industry. I am talking about. Yes. And most of the laborer come from Bengal and Odisha. Now, can we also motivate the industrialists in Surat? Say, for example. To move into Orissa and Bengal. Yes, also opportunity. Yeah. Where the labor is easily available. They may not come to Surat, so let us go there. Maybe that could be one area. Another area also could be, for example, due to this uh, misconception about uh, certain jobs being considered as superior and certain jobs being considered as inferior. For example, I come from Maharashtra. And unfortunately, Maharashtrians our people in our rural areas, interior Maharashtra, they lack in uh, certain skills. Now, if we equip them with those skills, maybe in Mumbai, we did not have workers coming from Uttar Pradesh and other areas, although they are welcome. But maybe Maharashtrians also can uh, take up those jobs if we equip them with requisite, school, uh, requisite skills. For example, there is uh, a big uh, business uh, which is known as painting of buildings. Now, there are some skilled set of people. They are known in our area as gangs, painters gangs. And they come from Satara district, which is in Maharashtra. And no other district provides this manpower. Now, why this should be there? I mean, this is not a very high skilled job as such, although you require some uh, specific skill set, no doubt about it. But then we can 
we can open up some new opportunities at the same time what is also required to be done is this informality there is a beauty that goes with this informality there are several conveniences also but it needs to be converted into a formal certification for example milking a cow or a buffalo is not uh, all that difficult but it is not very easy as well but those who are into this business can we can we think about evolving a certificate course in cow milking let us let us presume and we award a certificate then it brings dignity to the person who is certificate holder into a very uh, small uh, and simple job apparently which is milking the cow or milking the buffalo maybe and then that certificate adds to his mobility as well yeah so i mean the, there are ways and means of converting the problem of unemployment today or livelihood crisis as what we describe because at the root of the whole thing is the not unemployment per se but unemployability which at times is contrived at times is artificial i think we have to put an end and taking this situation to our stride i'm sure we can do that uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I think uh, what, you, what, what we also noticed that uh, some of the more industrial units are saying we, we always thought this was unskilled labor and now they have gone and we tried to get just somebody else in. And now we find out that this unskilled is actually a lot of experiences in there. The, the, the predictability, noticing when a machine will, will start to break or this kind of things is all the tested knowledge and, uh, and, and which, which should be uh, recognized one way or another. I think I, I'm looking at the clock, so I don't want to uh, pull this uh, too much longer. And maybe, maybe uh, Satoshi, I can uh, ask you for a short comment, and then I come back to Dr. Vine for a last uh, comment, maybe on this topic. So, Satoshi, uh, uh, overall uh, on the reflection, what would be your 30-second take on this? Yeah, thank you, Rene. Well, it's a really well stimulating discussions that you you have now, uh, particularly on the uh, the local. Uh, the economic or the development uh, to what's the situation now. And uh, I think well, the one thing is that, yeah, and also the benign mentioned about well, the importance of the, well, the opt, opt, uh, sort of well, the uh, optimistic or well, the way of thinking that can create what well, the demand, the, the consumers for well, the demand and for the confidence of them, so that for the creating the demand, uh, the confidence for the market, uh, that can go to the, the, the uh, more ease of the production, and for the, that can go uh, reactivating the enterprise or the activities. That's what the kind of the, the link. That's really interesting. And and the in terms of the local economic development, uh, I know what the listen to organize the start your business training, which is uh, business startup training for the, the micro micro entrepreneurs uh, on the uh, online the uh, the service. Uh, it, it we we did it for the first time and it, it went well. And this could for the kind of the provide opportunity for the young uh, potential entrepreneur to think about uh, the as to how they can do business. Uh, many of them are returned migrant workers. Yeah. And for yeah. the, I think for the employing the the uh, what is for the missing. I, I mean in the. Uh, uh migrant workers receiving areas for the first for the considering the possibility whether this kind of uh, the, the human resource available the locally particularly the young or the persons uh whether if we stay there a little bit about the training whether they can do the jobs in the states rather than for the employing the people from outside the state yeah. that's one thing but also the uh uh, local economic for the development, uh, it is for the importance that for the, the potential entrepreneurs thinking about uh, seeing, observing the changes going on now. What kind of market going to be what developed in the, in the locality? Is it a, just a temporary change or is it a long lasting changes that was, uh, the, the happened during this uh, the COVID-19 uh, situation? And see what kind of changes going on and how they can take it 
it is as an opportunity for the business opportunity to develop the, the new world businesses. And obviously, it is important for the, the government to support this kind of person to make it easier to, to, to start up the businesses. And also, in terms of the um, uh, the the uh, the value chain, uh, even the small enterprises like uh, the home based for the workers will be producing, uh, like uh, the the knitting or the kilts kind of things. That's also linked to the the, the global supply chains. So as to how this sort of things can be considered as the business opportunities. And as to how we can also protect these for the whole, for, for example, the home base for the workers in this sort of situation. Again, I'm coming back to the, the building back for the better if the, the, uh, the health insurance could be what provided and accessible by these for the workers as well. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Satoshi. Uh, Dr. Vinay, would you like a, a short closing comment? Well, uh, I believe uh, the challenge that COVID-19 has thrown before the entire humanity, not only industries uh, or employers and employees or certain sections of the society, but all of us are uh, facing this uh, challenge and facing this crisis. And therefore, the importance of collective efforts and uh, thinking about all aspects of the situation, it's something which is very, very required, which is very, very fundamental. And that starts with, as I said in my initial comments, that uh, some kind of a basic sensitivity in our uh, approaches, uh, in whatever the decisions we take or whatever uh, the moves that we make in our uh, own establishment, it might be an enterprise, it might be a, a big industry or a small MSME industry or whatever it is. And that sensitivity alone is going to help us uh, tide over this crisis. If we are, if we continue to be insensitive, if we continue to be unconcerned, if we continue to be disregarding the uh, deprived sections of the society, then the, I think the crisis will be further deepened and uh, it may land us into several uh, other issues as well. And therefore, basic fundamental human sensitivity is the need of the hour. Uh, thank you very much both for uh, your contribution, Dr. Vinay Satoshi. I think uh, what, what, what we've uh, said, uh, COVID doesn't make a difference between people and vice versa, we can also turn it around. So everybody will have to contribute to the fight against uh, uh, COVID and turning our uh, economies back on uh, into uh, a growth mode and uh, develop the country again. So with that, I hand over back to Maitre for uh, closing the event. Thank you so much, uh, esteemed guests, for sharing your thoughts and taking out time. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vinay, Mr. Satoshi, and thank you, Dr. Rene. The thoughts, ideas, and insights shared were indeed enlightening and hope they prove useful to our attendees also. I take this opportunity to thank our attendees as well for taking time out and uh, coming and contributing, participating in this forum. Uh, thank you again. Have a very good day.